another thing, and when we're talking about first properties, again, there is a a wider acceptance of purchasing with a relative or a friend. So, what are your thoughts around around that? Yes, it's it's not usually for the first home. I mean, yes, it is for the first home as well, but it's also you know buying these for investment properties. You know, you hear all the time that. You know, I want to buy a, uh, I want to build my investment pro- property portfolio with a friend or a relative because you know we combine the forces together and we can do a lot more. Understand from a bank's perspective, it's very very important to highlight it from a bank's perspective how this works. From a bank's perspective, when two people come to the bank together on you know buying an investment property, say four hundred thousand dollars worth of loan. The bank would hold both of you accountable and responsible for that property, and so it's not that you know each one of you uh, you know gives two hundred thousand, takes away two hundred thousand dollar worth of debt, and the total together becomes four hundred. In the bank's eyes, you know if it's person A and person B, person A owns four hundred thousand dollars, owes four hundred thousand dollars. Person B owns for owes four hundred thousand dollars. If person A disappears, person B pays. If person B disappears, person A pays. And so, typically, what the bank is doing is bank is almost blocking a serviceability of closer to about eight hundred thousand dollar in total, right? And so, a lot of people don't think about this, and they only find out this sort of stuff when they go out to buy a property of their own, and then that's when the bank realizes, no, you already have a debt of four hundred, and you know people are like, no, but I was only supposed to. You know, contribute two hundred thousand, and that's not how it typically works. And so, while it's a good idea to combine forces, it's only good idea to combine forces where you have done something within your own personal capacity first, and the residual serviceability. It's what's left is what you're trying to use now to combine forces. Okay, understand that both of you needs to be in the similar life cycle of property investment journey when you're coming in together. Okay. A lot of the times, what I see is there is one person who has a lot of assets already, and their borrowing capacity is only like say two hundred thousand dollars. And then there is one person who can borrow up to say eight hundred thousand dollars, and they both combine in together to buy a property for eight hundred. You know, thinking that it's divided for four hundred and four hundred. And the next thing you know, this one person, this person A, who had bigger serviceability, is basically get is held accountable for the full eight hundred thousand dollar loan. And the other person who has a lot of debts and has a serviceable or oh, and has the portfolio already gets look look sort of free kick because you know he's only you know putting in two hundred thousand dollars typically right because he does not he didn't even have the serviceability in the first place so it's important to start off at the equitable position and think about this as a long term gig not a short term gig as to how you're going to grow to get the portfolio together and it would be really really hard to split the portfolio. In the next sort of two or three years, you know, as you're growing this pro- property portfolio, the second thing is use proper structures. You know, don't just go about doing this in your own personal name. A lot of people do this sort of crazy, silly mistakes of doing it in your personal name. At least if you do it in proper structures, you can come out of that structure very quickly and hand it over to someone else. You know, or you know, depart ways, or you know, sell off your share to someone else, etc. And it provides you that flexibility, you know, without selling the asset, triggering capital gains, etc. All of those things too. And so, having the right structure in in bringing these deals together when you're buying it with a family or a relative is quite important and quite the key. The last one, which is also very very important, is understanding the tax implications out of things too, as to how this is going to be divided and how this is going to be serviced. Right. A key example that I'll share with you is. I know two people went into a deal where they were building houses and selling them, you know. And so they said, "Okay, we are going to buy a land, build a house, sell." One person had the serviceability. One person had the cash. The person who had the cash gave away the cash to the person who had the serviceability. So he built the house and he sold it in their personal name. And so typically, what happens is all the profits come in his own personal profile because it's not a company setup. And so every money, any money that he's giving in his head is basically, you know, happening in his own profile, right? You know, they don't have a business setup. They're not running it through ABN. And so from his perspective, any money that he's giving from a tax perspective, any money he's giving to someone else is off his disposable income as a gift, right? There is no business expenses per se. 
or he's returning the loan. And so it, there needs to be a corporate agreement in place or a JV agreement in place that dictates this. And it would potentially need to be done under an ABN because there were GST complications around this. And so we had to almost like, you know, go back and re-register his GST, open his ABN in a back date so that, you know, he can claim and manage some of these things so that he's not up for a big tax bill at the very end. So understanding some of these little nitty gritties around, you know, how do you come together in dealing these things? While it's a great idea, it's important to, you know, bypass some of these, you know, I call them, you know, um, the blow up minds, you know, that have been laid around as you're doing some of these partnerships. And then there are two th- other things to be aware of. Well, actually there's three. One, one is how you're structuring the ownership of that property. You know, there's, there's things called tenants in common where you basically or got joint tenancies. So that, that really depends on whether you've got 50, 50, 50, 50 ownership or you've got, you know, with 70, 30 ownership. So really important that you are across and are aware what that impact is. And the second thing is obviously, you know, things in your life change when you want to sell, you know, how to navigate that process. And you might go, well, every two years we'll see, you know, we if we hold or we sell, but we, we need to come up with some sort of agreement that says, well, if one person wants to and the other one doesn't, how do we deal with that, that situation? And if the other person does want to sell, how do we deal with that situation in terms of going, what's the value of that? What's the value of that side? And be aware because you are transferring some level of ownership, there might there, there may be stamp duty implications. <laughs>